So this is David Ross, and this is the Lions Roar podcast. Um, This podcast is going to go up um, for everyone to listen to. Um, It's going to be open, um, unlike a lot of the podcasts, which uh, you need a subscription to get. I think it's because it's going to talk about a lot of very, very important things. I think it's stuff that needs to be discussed. Um, Lord knows there is no shortage of misinformation on the Chinese martial arts. So starting off with um, the most basic idea, which is... um, Unfortunately, on the internet especially, people are very much into black and white, either yes or no. And the truth is always somewhere in between. It's something in the gray. So in other words, it's either um, Kung Fu could never, never was about fighting, never was effective, it's all bullshit, or, um, and pardon, you know, not safe for work. Um, Or, you know, uh, if you ever fought real Kung Fu, real Shaolin, they would kill you instantly with the death touch. And they're both basically absurd positions um most people i think are confronted with stuff that is contradictory uh information that is contradictory and they want to make sense of it um and so if you see something that indicates that chinese martial arts people were are not effective or were not effective why how why are they not effective um was it something that started at a certain point when did it start why did it start um that kind of stuff um or you know that it never worked so i'm just sort of gathering my my myself up here for this um and i have some notes because there's so much to talk about here i want to make sure that i'm not um uh going to miss some points that I think are important points. So so have a little bit of patience with me while I go through this. Um, I, I'm responding, as I usually am, to something particular. There's a video on YouTube. Um, it's an interview with a guy that was one of the first people to start fighting in what would be sort of the modern version of Sancho Sanda. In other words, he said in 1979 they came together, they started um, rules, and they started fighting, and he talks about some stuff. Um, the first mistake people make, obviously, is, well, aha, nothing before 1979, nobody could fight, it was, you know, it started in 1979, this is how it started, and and this is what it was. It's not quite that, it's one story in a much larger picture. Second of all, it's a single guy, so a single person's experience is never the ultimate truth, it's only the truth for him. But second of all, also, when you're uh, being interviewed in 2020, right, it's 2020, I'm double-checking myself, knock on wood um and you're talking about 1979 you're talking about 41 years ago so maybe your recollections are are a little off um but it's a good discussion it has truth in it and it leads us to a a bigger larger discussion so and again you know like um being a fanboy and um, embracing kung fu movies and fantasy is no replacement for logic and facts and documents. Um, I, I started off in Chinese martial arts. I started off like most people, pardon me, um, enamored by the, the mysticism of it. Um, we, we thought that, you know, the masters could all fight. And uh, b- believe it or not, there was a time when there wasn't YouTube. There was a time when you couldn't just find videos of anything. And so, it was long discussed that two masters, Wu Gong Yi, who was of the Wu style Tai Chi, and Chan Hak Fu, um, of um, Tibetan White Crane, Ba Kok Pai. Chan Si Fu and Wu Si Fu, two mean A fight that took place in Macau, in 1954. Um, there's a lot said about this. And again, when I was young and I was training Chinese martial arts in Chinatown and training with my teacher, Chan, Hak, uh, Chan Tai San. Um, and Chan Tai San was very good friends with Chan Hak Fu. We had uh, met him many times. We'd had dinner with him many times. We knew him very well. Um, we had heard about this. And so the presumption, being a Kung Fu person at that time, was that when masters fought, it must have been something rather impressive. But again, there was no YouTube. So I remember, you know, Chan Hak Fu would come into New York City 
um, for Chinese New Year. And we would frequently lie and dance with the White Crane Association because they were related to, to Lama Pai and my teacher was very good friends with Chan Hak Fu. And so we would help out and then frequently we'd go and have dinner. So, um, again, like, this is like talking about science fiction or something. Like, Chan Dai San walked into our school with a VHS tape. Um, I think some people may not even know what a VHS tape is, but it's a videotape. And we have video machine in, and he goes, this is the fight. We go, wow, we've heard about this for years. We've never seen it, and we stuck it in. Now, of course, you can find this fight all over YouTube, and most people, when they see it, go, what? I mean, there is no nice way to say it. It's horrible. Um, it, it looks like guys that had never sparred, never fought, trying to fight for the first time. And it's basically because it what it was. In other words, if all you're doing is drilling your forms, you're the first time you fight. And again, anybody that's done any kind of sparring. We know this, right? You train in the school for three to six months, you know, and then you even do some partner work. You're feeling pretty good, and then the first time you spar, you fall apart. The fight is horrible. It is not two masters fighting. There is nothing... And again, there there was an article written in one of the in Tai Chi magazines that tried to make it like, you don't understand what you're looking at. They're really trying to hit, like, little secret points on the arms. I mean, you know, denial is not just a river in Egypt. Um, it is uh, astounding the lengths that people will go to deny fact in order to maintain their cognitive distance, dissonance and to maintain their fantasy. But I don't believe in any of that. I call them like they are. And even though Chan Hak Fu was a friend of Chan Tai San, and I'm going to get there in a minute also, I'm going to say something nice about them also. But for right now, let us just deal with the fact that by looking at that fight by any objective standard, it is horrible. The more you find out about it, the more you see some of the inherent problems in Chinese martial arts. They assumed that two masters fighting it was going to be deadly. So it was like all these rules, like they weren't supposed to be kicking, they weren't supposed to be wrestling. So basically they made it like a boxing match with two guys that had never boxed, bare knuckle. And it's horrible. Now what I'm going to say positive about this. Um, neither side made excuses. Neither side... Um, claim that it wasn't what it was neither side stayed stagnant and didn't respond to it both sides responded to it in particular Chan Hak Fu because if we know closer to him um, and said it to us I, I, I made the faux pas or I was just being the dumb American of asking him about the fight after we saw it on VHS um, Chan Tai San was not thrilled at me about doing this but I did it anyway and the response I got was, after this, we started sparring with boxing gloves. And then if you know something about um, Bak Hok Pai, um, Tibetan White Crane, in the 70s, in the um, Southeast Asian tournaments, um, they fought, and they fought well. Because in 54, as a response to this, they got some boxing gloves and started sparring regularly with boxing gloves. And, of course, that's the answer to fixing a lot of problems that you have with making your material applicable. But I spoke to the Wu family at one point. Um, I believe it was his grandson or his... It was his son, I think. Um, and they were not as forthcoming, probably because they didn't know me from anyone. I, you know, they, I just approached them. But... There's no question that Wu Stao Tai Chi also started training with boxing gloves and had guys that could fight later on. So, I, I would say that what's important is that unlike that article that was put in that Tai Chi magazine that tried to make excuses and deny the obvious, 
uh, kudos to both sides for seeing it for what it was and doing something to improve the situation as opposed to burying your head in the sand. But obviously, when you look at that, you go, well, does that mean before 1954 nobody could fight? Chinese martial arts was a fraud because these guys are supposed to be masters. Well, it's a little more complicated, and one of the, the answers to that is that in 1954, you're dealing with a population that had been displaced by a war with Japan and by a civil war, and which were in Hong Kong, where under um, British control in Hong Kong, they were not allowed to spar, they were not encouraged, they were discouraged from fighting, learning to do things for fighting. So, if you, you know, sort of generally say, starting with 1937, most martial arts training was disrupted by the uh, war with Japan, which we call World War II, until 49, when, you know, uh, people that didn't want to live in communist China uh, moved to places like Macau and Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, you're talking about... Um, you know, uh, 12 years or so of disrupted martial arts training. So, that's one answer. But again, there's other stuff. You know, we, we also heard about these fights that were done on rooftops. This is very popular among Wing Chun people. Um, there were these fights on these rooftops, and again, they were billed as these very, like, you know, mean, nasty, no-holds-barred fights that proved the fighting ability. And then, um, apparently, Bruce Lee himself had taken some 8mm of these, and um, a couple of documentaries about Bruce Lee dug out these 8mm, and lo and behold, you found them on YouTube, and you look at them, and when you look at the rooftop fights in Hong Kong, um, again, it looks like a slap fight. It looks like kids slap boxing. It's not impressive. Some of it is t terrible, just bad. Right? So again, like, well, this used to be the evidence that they could fight, but instead it's the evidence that they, they couldn't fight. So people were confused by this. Then, of course, you know, and, and this becomes because um, you've got Kung Fu people that, like, say that real Kung Fu, you know, like they blow up your liver, you know, at a thousand yards with a plastic sheet. And the Muay Thai people that are just, you know, uh, not all Muay Thai people, like tons of friends are Muay Thai, but there's a certain segment. They're fanboys. The same way you have Kung Fu fanboys, you have Muay Thai fanboys. And they're not interested in fact. They're not interested in logic. Um, they see everything in black and white. You know, Muay Thai is better than everything. So they point to a lot of matches. And there were a lot of matches. Um, I was engaged in the conversation um, on this other video about the, the beginnings of modern San show, modern Sanda. Um, I went back and I, I looked through some things. So let's look. Um, in 1921, there was a single match. Uh, a Chinese Kung Fu person challenged a Muay Thai fighter. Um, the match supposedly went about three minutes. This was called one of the most violent and bloody matches in Muay Thai history. And the Chinese fighter spent several weeks in a hospital afterwards. In 1958, there was a team of, um, translated from Cantonese, they said Tai Gek, but they mean Tai Chi. Five fighters representing Tai Chi, which to me is astounding because um, when we start talking about the Lei Tai fights, we'll talk about the fact that the Tai Chi people didn't fight. But in 1958, five guys that said they represented Tai Chi fought Muay Thai fighters and lost. Um, there is a reference to a team from actually... People's Republic of China, meaning mainland, fighting Thai fighters sometime in the 60s. Um, it's a reference in the, in the article that talks about the 73 and 74 matches. It said that um, previous to the Hong Kong team arriving in 73, there had been a match where people from the People's Republic of China, being from communist mainland, had fought Thais and lost. Then there's a lot of detail because we have this article that was published in June of 1974 
of which we can get some screen captures of. Um, talking about uh, two events that were in 1973 and 1974, um, which again, the Chinese lost. Um, in the first one, right, um, the Chinese team apparently first began by breaking bricks and having their students kick and punch them to quote demonstrate quote unquote iron body and then all five got either KO'd or TKO'd um, what's interesting is that most of the accounts say they were KO'd but then when you read some of the details they were actually TKO's a TKO is like um, one of the guys got up realized he was bleeding when he looked at his own blood he gave up so he wasn't knocked unconscious knocked out he was it's a technical knockout um another guy uh stood up but was you know they were waved off because he just wasn't completely there um all in the f first first round so in 1973 five chinese fighters showed up they did brick breaking and quote-unquote demonstrations of iron body and it didn't mean anything they all got ko'd or tko'd in the first round the brick breaking and the iron body stuff, um, you know, this is the reality, right? When we start really uh, deconstructing this and we really start discussing um, the, the different things going on here, is you have to remember that in Chinese culture and Chinese society and the history of Chinese martial arts, Chinese martial arts people were always part of what they call the Jiang He, you know, uh, it's a subculture. And in order to make a living like other people in the Jiang He uh, subculture, they often engaged in street performances. Um, this happened with Shui Jiao people also. Perfectly good. And, and, you know, after the Shang Pu was disbanded, which was, you know, this elite force inside the capital, you know, the, the, the Forbidden City. Um, re very real tough wrestlers that had wrestled the Mongolians and stuff. They started doing show wrestling. So it's, it's all over. In other words, you need to get money. So you need to do shows on the street. You need to entertain people. Um, and so the typical Chinese is just as uninformed and just as gullible as the typical Westerner um, breaking bricks and like, you know, do stay, putting your arms up over your head and having your student quote unquote hit you or kick you to do stuff. Um, these are carnival tricks. They're sideshow tricks. They're street performance stuff. They really have nothing to do with fighting. But unfortunately, because they were so much part of the life of the typical Chinese martial arts person, even the legitimate Chinese martial arts person that it was confused so they thought literally like by breaking bricks they were going to break Thai boxers you know and by having their student hitting them and laying them you know taking the blow they were going to take the blows then of course 74 they arranged the second set of matches and of course the aha moment you know we were forced to wear gloves the first time if we weren't allowed to wear gloves it'll be all different what is astounding when you look at the history of fighting events and Chinese martial arts is how little has changed. How much the same misconceptions, the same excuses, and the same illogical thinking persists. So if you know something about Muay Thai, if you know something about Thai boxing, you realize that it evolved from a bare knuckle fighting format. And then in the 20s, they started copying Western boxing, which is why they adopted a boxing ring rounds, shorts, and boxing gloves. Um, and some people say that for the reason that Thai boxing doesn't favor the boxing, the punching with the gloves as much, is because, you know, the gloves cover the hand and it's not the same thing as when it used to be bare knuckle. I mean, at least that's one trend going on in Thailand among Muay Thai people. And so the elbow, which is not covered in a glove, and the shin and the knee, which is not covered in padding, um, is va more valued by most, you know, uh, Muay Thai purists than the gloved hand. So, you know, if we read through the, I read through several articles getting prepared for this. Um, there was some trepidation about not having gloves, but ultimately they agreed to let the Chinese fight without gloves, but the Thais fought with gloves. I guess the Thais knowing that you can break your hand without gloves, didn't want to break their hands in what basically was an exhibition bout because remember, for the ties, it's a way to make a living. And if they broke their hand on 
a Chinese guy's head for an exhibition bout and missed three or four real Muay Thai fights, they weren't going to get paid. But they agreed. So those were not an issue. I also dug up something which is very interesting, which is that in both 1973 and 1974, all throws were legal. That's sometimes an issue when we look at these events between um, Muay Thai people and Chinese because throwing is so integral to Chinese martial arts and making it effective that if you do pure rules where a lot of the throwing techniques are illegal, you could argue that the format is, an, is a reason why Chinese fighters didn't perform as well. So, considering that they were allowed to fight with bare hands, which is what they requested, and considering they were allowed to fight with throws, we look again at five fights and five first round KOs or TKOs. So, you look at Wu Gong Yi versus Chan Hak Fu, um, or Wu Gong Yi versus Chan Hak Fu in 1954. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five different um, documented events of uh, Muay Thai versus Chinese fighters. We have um, the rooftop fights, which are also pretty hideous. So the question is, was Kung Fu never really a fighting art? Were people never really able to fight? Is there something wrong with Chinese martial arts? So the answer is never black and white. It's it's always a shade of gray. For all the times that the Thais beat Chinese, and there were quite a lot, there were times when the um, Chinese beat Thais. Um, there is a Tan Guan Cheng. Um, he's from Malaysia, so there's a Tan, Tan Guan Cheng, which is, you know, Malaysian pronunciation um, or some dialect of Chinese pronunciation. Um, there's some question about whether the Tan, but in the press he was Tan Guan Cheng. Some people said they knew him, some people say he's affiliated with Seven Star Praying Mantis. Um, but we have some accounts of him fighting. We know that he was called the Saint of Penang, you know, Malaysia. Um, and we know, and we have a picture of him fighting with these little, kind of like, almost MMA gloves, open finger gloves. And we know that he beat at least one Thai. Some accounts say he beat several Thais. But they said being in Malaysia, you know, he was already very exposed to people practicing Thai boxing. He did a lot of free sparring. Um, he trained very hard. And he had good strategies. And also he used a lot of throws. And so, for example, in the one that we can completely verify where he beat a Muay Thai fighter from Thailand. He used a throw that dislocated the shoulder of the Thai that he fought. And so, dislocated his shoulder on a throw. Fighter wasn't able to continue. He won. There's a couple of these. Um, in the 70s, there was quite, despite what one guy said on the other thread, which just, you know, was in complete denial about, you know, all kinds of facts. Um, if, for example, if you deny that during the Northern Expedition... 27 to 28 the Shaolin Temple was burned down and you say that it was never you know uh, vacated and was never empty um, at that point there's really no point in having a discussion with you because you're not living in the real world and you know to you facts don't matter um, and you know at, I, I, I really do strive when I have conversations with people online not to be you know uh, mean or a bully or, or crude or you know all these things that they say but at some point you just got to call things for what they are, which is that if I show you a newspaper and you go, but that's not real, and I show you a picture and go, that never really happened, and if there's something that is just, has a staggering amount of documentation, and you just flat out deny it, there's not much more to do here. Right? So, um, you know, there was quite a lot of events going on in the 60s and the 70s where Chinese fighters were fighting Muay Thai fighters. Um, there was a thing called the South Asian or Southeast Asian Cup, um, which was Chinese martial arts, Kung Fu people fighting other Kung Fu people, and sometimes Thais would enter, and sometimes people with 
mixed backgrounds, meaning they were Kung Fu people with a little bit of cross-training in Thai boxing. Um, these events took place in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in Macau, in Malaysia. They took care of all over Southeast Asia. And it was quite a lot of events. And um, we know, for example, the the Daising Pekwa Mun, most people you would, you would call monkey stylists. Chan Sao Jung's people fought some of them. And we know in at least one case, um, one of Chan Sao Jung's students beat in Hong Kong um, a guy that had, had been ranked. Now, of course, the counter argument was that, you know, that Muay Thai fighter had been ranked in the stadium, but by the time he fought in the Southeast Asian Cup, they were fighting because they're, you know, had they reached their peak and they were on their way down. Still, he wasn't an amateur by any stretch of the imagination. You assume if he was ranked in Lumpany before he fought, the guy must have had at least 100 fights. You know, he was, he was no walkover. Um... We know that, like I said, the White Crane people, the Bok Pai people fought people, Charlie Fought people fought, uh, Thai boxers. So, we have evidence that Chinese martial arts people were able to train realistically, adapt, and fight. We certainly have, because of the um, Central Guoshu Academy and the national events that were sponsored by um, the Generals and the, the Guoshu Academy, Guoshu Academy, um, a record of people fighting and again it's instructive to show us what the reality was which is that there have always been people that could fight and there's always been people that weren't trained to fight or weren't interested in fighting and there were always people also that were not trained to fight but were deluded into thinking that they could fight so, you know, uh, one of the famous quotes uh, Zhao Dao Qin said, you know, that when it came to the Koshu events, the Lei Tai events, you know, a lot of people just made excuses and sat in the stands. Like, you know, Kung Fu is not for sport. It's just for life and death fighting. You know, lofty monks and local grandmasters didn't do it. And he said, you know, they were scared because they might have gotten beaten up. Or, you know, or excuses, everyone has them. You know, they're like noses, everyone has them, and they all smell. Um, some people, though, entered, and, you know, just like Xu Xiaodong knocking out all these masters, they thought they could fight, they were wrong, and they got shown up. But then there's tons of people that were fighting, that fought well, that won. I mean, you know, and, and even the people that didn't win, you know, they have the, the first three places, well, obviously they fought, you know, because... Though some of these events had 125 people, so if you got to the first three, you know, you had five or six fights, and maybe you lost two of them, or you lost one of them, or you lost none of them, right? But even guys that didn't place, that came in the first 15, these guys were all fighting. And, and we have enough accounts that, you know, um, we have one where um, a, a player is uh, put on the lay tie against a very famous teacher from Shanghai who um, was very successful because he trained the... Um, the security people for a large chain of department stores. This would be like the guy who's the head of security of Macy's, or you know, um, one of these big chains. And he was supposed to be a master of iron palm, you know, breaking bricks and um, iron body. And so when he first entered this, everybody assumed, well, this is a guy who trains hundreds of fighters, has thousands of students in Shanghai, and he's a master of iron palm and iron body. In other words, you can't hurt him, and he can kill you with a single strike fighting a guy who was like 18, 19 years old. Um, and the account goes, it's very detailed, and it's why it's good to have these accounts. He unfortunately got hit by the guy, and the guy, because he does Iron Palm, hit very, very hard. But surprise, surprise, he didn't kill him. He didn't even knock him out. He didn't even incapacitate him. He just hit him really hard. And the guy, the young kid, we'll call him, um, had sparring experience, so he knew how to adapt. And so he started fighting like, you know, what we call stick and move, hit and run. And he frustrated the guy, Mr. Iron Palm. And he frustrated the Iron par Body guy. Kicked him, swept him, moved away. Hit him, moved away. Hit him, moved away. Didn't stand there like, you know, you know how you train Iron Palm, right? You, you have a, a table and a bag and you pound it. Well, don't be the bag on the table. Don't stand there and take the pounding. 
So he moved in and out, moved in and out. And then finally, when he tired him out and when he did enough damage, he ended up hitting him so hard that he went down. And um, accounts vary about whether he didn't get up or didn't get up in time or he was so frustrated from being knocked down. Um, he made some excuses, but basically he lost. But we know from accounts like this that the 17, 18, 19 year old kid, and I'm just, just to differentiate him from the older master of the Iron Palm, had sparring experience. We know a lot of these people had had sparring experience. We knew they were training correctly. Now, one of the observations also is that when people are really interested in fighting, um, they don't tend to embrace extremist ideas, relying upon things like, you know, uh, cheap power or dim mock or breaking bricks or iron body. And they also tend to be open to other training methods. So we know that a lot of these people were cross-training in Western boxing and judo, which were readily available in the 20s and the 30s in China. So Chinese martial arts clearly had people that could fight. But we learn other things. That, you know, there's, there's things hanging around that have created these problems. It's not, well, all kung fu people can fight, and there's no problems with kung fu. Kung fu is great. Yay, let's all get in a circle and salute the, the, the Kung Fu flag. No, there are issues. Um, in the first official event, which was in 1928, that was sponsored, um, they had sparred, some of them had fought, but clearly not enough of them had enough experience to avoid injuries. So in a tournament where you had to fight more than once, after a couple of rounds, there were so many injuries, they had to stop. Now, of course, the propaganda was, you know, they stopped because they were afraid that people would die and would kill off the next generation of masters. No, they broke their hands and their feet, just like in the first couple of UFCs when people were fighting bare knuckle, they broke hands on, you know, the top of people's heads, which are hard, or on elbows, or they broke their foot on knees and shins. Um, but what's interesting is the lesson that people in the United States learned in 19, what, 93, when the first UFC, the Chinese could have, should have, maybe some of them did learn in 1928. 1929, they had another event. That one, at least they got a, a winners, you know, first, second, and third place, and 14th place, and whatever. But they had problems also, because the rules were wrong, and so they had draws, and if there was a draw, everyone advanced. So, the generals, which were the officials running the event, pardon me, um, realized that people were taking it easy because if it's a draw, everybody goes forward. So then they made a rule that if it was a draw, both people were eliminated. This creates a great sense of urgency. So then when people are really, really trying to win, what do they do? They go in 100%. And so there was a lot of injuries, particularly to people's face and heads, because the easiest thing to do is ball up your fist and punch somebody in the face. That is one of the greatest lessons you can ever learn. Um, for those that do not know, um, I sponsored Sancho and Sanda and even some Muay Thai matches for more than a decade in New York. Um, I worked as a matchmaker. Um, I, I was a co-promoter. I did tournaments with open, you know, Sancho tournaments in them. And, for example, we would get Kyokushin people. You know, bravo, because they were willing to fight. They were willing to fight out of their element. And they were very good fighters. They were very well conditioned. They had good kicks, excellent kicks. A lot of them also had good throws. What they didn't have, though, was a lot of experience with punching to the face because it's illegal in Kyokushin. So what we found out was that the biggest problem for Kyokushin people was in Sancho or Sanda, where you have gloves and you're allowed to punch the face, they got punched in the face a lot. Punching the face changes everything. Which is why also the thing that popped up here in 1929 in Hangzhou was when people started getting punched in the face a lot, get punched in the head a lot, they created the infamous no continuous punching to the head rule, which survived into modern Sancho that we were fighting in, what, um, up until about 2004, I think, was still a rule. And I said, you're fighting full contact, except you can't punch each other in the face. It's an absurd rule. Um, just like Kyokushin, it gives people a false sense of things. Um, it's a rule, honestly, where you know that the people writing the rules are not people that have fought or have trained fighters. But a lot of times, that's exactly who's been in charge of Chinese martial arts. 
Um, I could create a whole different podcast about how Sancho died in the United States. And the short answer is that people that didn't fight and didn't train fighters were in charge of the tournaments and made the decisions that ultimately killed Sancho in the United States. And part of it was also because they don't have a, they have not have a vested interest, they had a vested interest in dying. Because if you're training people that are just great forms per performers and everyone idolizes them and then they go up on the stage and they get knocked out in one round, you know, the Chinese use the term rice bag. Um, I think you all know what that means. Uh, if your students are great at forms but cannot fight and get beaten up by guys with six weeks or six months training, that's going to affect your rice bag. So, there's a lot of this stuff. You know, when we get, and like I said, that this these kind of strange rules found their way into even what we call modern Sancho or modern Sanda. But, you know, in the 20s and the 30s, there was a whole bunch of events. And remember, you know, in 33, Chang Dongcheng, you know, Grandmaster of Shui Zhao, who is my master's master's master, my master's master, you know, great, my Sigong um, on Shui Zhao on that side of my, my lineage. He won the 33 tournament. He won the 48 tournament. He was the only one that won both of them, both won two titles. Um, certainly knew how to fight, uh, trained military and police. Um, after the, the conclusion of the Civil War, when the mainland became communist, he went to Taiwan. He worked there, training military and police, and continued to train fighters. So, if you're looking for someone that knew how to fight, I remember Chang fought plenty of challenge matches also. A number of them well documented also. And was undefeated, and continued to train people that could fight, and the people he trained continue to train people that could fight. It's not a question, right? Um, there's footage, black and white footage, in Ohio in the early 80s. He introduced what you know we would now call Sancho. And then put on chest protectors and headgear and fighting for full contact, not just kickboxing, but with throws. Because that's what he knew. You know, he had been an instructor at the Central Quotient Academy. He had fought under those rules. And he knew that they were good for, for training people. He trained, you know, military and police. On the mainland also, you have, you know, um, my other teacher, my primary teacher, Shantai San. The same year that um, Wu Yi, Wu Yi fought Chan Hak Fu in Macau, and it was a debacle, um, on the mainland, in the communist-controlled mainland, there was a provincial sparring tournament in Guangdong, in Canton, in 1954. Um, there are some pictures of it. There's no video of it. Chan san and his uh, Si Hing, his senior classmate. Um, Chan san took third. His classmate, his senior classmate, took second, which evoked from us, the students, wow, who took third? I mean, who took first? Who beat the two of you guys if you're third and second? Because Chan san was pretty tough and said... You know, that his senior was even tougher than he was. And his senior in Canton ended up, um, Lei Fei San was his name. Um, he passed away, unfortunately. But he trained the police and special forces. Chan San also trained the Futsan special forces. Trained police and military. Um, we said, and again, you know, like from the original perspective of being young kids, we thought it was going to be some magical secret. Well, what did he do to beat you two guys? It was Xing Yi guy. Well, what did he do? What was special tactics he used? He hit really hard. So you do five fists and you do th do them thousands and thousands of times. You hit really hard. That's the other thing. There's no secrets to this. Fighting is fighting. It's not going to look like a Kung Fu movie. It's not going to look like a Shaolin form. There's no iron body and, and iron palm involved. It is like get punched in the face, get thrown on the ground, get hit in the body... Not have the wind, have the wind knocked out of you. But by every indication, this was a pretty rough tournament with people that could really fight. Now, of course, in the 20s and the 30s, there were, like I said, you know, the Zhao Daoshin's, you know, comment about how there was a lot of guys that, you know, uh, didn't, um, you know, uh, fight. Um... I mean, other things. Let me, here, I made notes about this so I wouldn't forget about this. 
right? Does this sound familiar? Um, the 29 Hangzhou event, Wang Jiqing won first. He was, a, among other things, a Shui Jiao or Chinese wrestling person, and he won using a lot of throws. But he ate a lot of punches, and there's a picture of him with his face all black and blue and swollen from eating a lot of punches. Sort of like the UFCs where, you know, jiu-jitsu people knew that they had to get in and grapple and take the guy to the ground. Or wrestling guys that, you know, knew that once they got to the ground, they would be able to pound you, but they didn't have a lot of stand-up. So they ate a lot of punches. But there was also uh, Ju Guo Lu, who won um, second? Second. Who won second. Um, who did Xing Yi, but also openly said that he trained Western boxing in Shanghai. And he was criticized for this. Some Tai Chi masters. Now again, I, I said this earlier in the podcast. What's interesting about all the Lei Tai events in the 20s and the 30s is, one, there's like a million Xing Yi guys. Everybody that did Xing Yi like signed up to fight and fought. Um, and it's interesting because it's a quote-unquote internal system, but yet these guys were more than willing to put their hands up and fight. The Tai Chi people with the grand ultimate fist, none of them fought. All the masters were like special guests in the stands. Nobody representing Tai Chi fought in the 20s or the 30s. Now in 58, like I said, there was a, you know, a team of Tai Chi guys from Hong Kong that went to, to, to Thailand. But in the 20s and the 30s, it was interesting. But what's interesting is, you know, uh, when Ju Guo, Guo Lu won, one of the Tai Chi masters criticized him saying, well, that's not real Chinese martial arts because he uses boxing. Sound familiar, right? That's just kickboxing. That's not real. So his brother, one of his brothers, he had two or three brothers, challenged the master to which the master went, um, I'm going to go sit over here. So that sounds there are also people that talk crap and then when they're called out on it, you know, disappear. Um, so there was, there was plenty of people that were deluded, plenty of people that couldn't fight, but then there was people that could fight. That's important to remember. But... It becomes a problem also, especially as we go toward the war period. Um, and also because, starting in the 20s and the 30s, for example, on the nationalist side, well, the people that could fight, one of the reasons they held these late Thai events, was that the government grabbed the people that could fight, like Cheng Dongsheng and like uh, Ju and like, um, you know, Wong, Ji, Ji Jing, right? And put them in the Central Kosho Academy to train basically military or, you know, police officers, um, to remove the application from the general population. The communists definitely did this, which was interesting too, because when the communists were the rebels, when the communists were looking to um, uh, destabilize, you know, regional, local level, they would employ martial arts groups often, you know, and, and gangs and stuff. But of course, when they became the central government, they were in the opposite position and they wanted to remove all those local power bases. So, you know, after 49, one of the problems is going to be people like Chan Tai San and Lei Fei San, his Si Hing, um, were encouraged not to teach civilians the application stuff. And by not encouraged, I mean were threatened. Um, people don't realize this, but until the 80s, having a book about San Shou could get you put in prison in mainland China. And San Shou predates either the 91 world championships or as this interview talks about 79 there's a 1956 book called sancho but it was supposed to be only for military training um again so problem being that in the general population in the 20s and 30s there were people that could fight and people that couldn't fight but the people that could fight slowly start getting filtered out and pulled out of the general population and recruited to train only military and police under government control, whether it was nationalist government or later communist government. So that's a problem. Now, let's get to the war period, because that disrupted everything, you know, and a lot of people were killed. And a lot of the people that went to fight were also the people that could fight with Chinese martial arts. And, for example, my teacher, Chan Tai San, was in this... Uh, kind of like um, guerrilla warfare unit that fought the Japanese. They didn't have the proper munitions. They didn't have the proper equipment. It was very bloody, very uh, 
nasty hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And um, a lot of them were killed. So that also filters out the people. After the war, well, people like Cheng Dongsheng went to Taiwan. Now, Taiwan was different than Hong Kong. Hong Kong was under British control, and the British didn't want mayhem. So they prevented people from sparring in the schools, and they uh, you know, discouraged training for, for fighting application. Taiwan under the Nationalists, the Nationalist government was largely composed of the same generals who practiced martial arts themselves, were extremely nationalistic, were pro-training martial arts, had set up the Central Koshu Institute, and Taiwan continued to have national Leitai events. And there was a lot of fighting going on in Taiwan. If you also want to look for people that had Chinese martial arts backgrounds and could fight, look at Hong Yishang. You know, the Tang Shou Dao. Qing Yi, Ba Gua, Tai Chi. I think mostly known for his using Qing Yi to fight. And, you know, my friend Mike Patterson and a lot of other people that are affiliated with this. A lot of people that you probably know as Chinese martial arts people that are grounded in reality are related to the same couple of lineages, whether it's uh, Hong Yishong, you know, Yijong, um, Xing Yi and Bagua people, or, you know, the, the, the Tibetan Lama Hapka, uh, Tibetan White Crane people, or the Cholefa people. Um, and a lot of them know each other, and there's a lot of cross-pollination, and, you know, uh, uh, it's very, the word would be incestuous, I guess. Um, you can't deny that there were people that knew how to fight because there's just so much evidence of it. But you have to understand it within context. In the mainland, like I said, after 49 when the communists take over, well, they kept Wushu as a form of physical uh, culture, physical fitness, but they wanted to remove the fighting aspect. And, in, you know, like when the Wushu teams came over to the United States and came over to Europe and they were asked about, well, do you do applications? Do you do sparring? The government line at that point was that, you know, comrades or cadre do not fight each other. Comrades do not fight comrades. What that really meant was that the civilians were not allowed to learn how to fight. Because, I can tell you through Chante San, who was my teacher, um, the people that could fight in China were recruited to train the military and the police. Um, there was a Sancho program going on in the military from at least the 50s, because I said in 56 they published the book. And then there was sparring, and there was sparring competition, because Chao Tai San took third in the provincial in 54, but then he did the all-military competition, I think in 58 or 59, and won that, which was like, you know, like a... They were like, not provincial, but like the south. So it's, he was down in Guangdong, so maybe Guangxi and uh, Fujian, the military units, had their tournament, and he won that one. And there probably was, you know, other tournaments up in the north and everything. But they were doing tournaments. They were sparring with gloves. They were fighting. Um, there's no question about it. But what were the civilians doing? Well, the civilians were encouraged to just do their forms and stay quiet. So we get back to what I originally started with, which is this conversation with this guy that talked about a 1979 event that led to what we call modern Sancho, you know, which in 91 premieres as an international event. And he says in 79 they got together and they decided that Chinese martial arts people don't have enough sparring experience or don't have any sparring experience. But again, he's talking about civilians. Let's remember that. He's not talking about all Chinese martial arts. So he points out that, you know, for example, he says that... Um, the throwing in, in Sancho came from one guy who came out of the police college. Um, I, I'm not going to say that that guy didn't contribute throws to the overall program, but he wasn't the only one because we know he's not the only one because there's a Li who is a, a, te a very famous Shui Zhao teacher in Beijing who also contributed a ton of Shui Zhao to um, Sancho programs. Um, we also know that Sancho was not a standard program in the South. It was more influenced by Southern martial arts like Charlie Fett and, and Hong Gan in the North. Obviously, it was more influenced by Shui Zhao and uh, Xing Yi and things like that. Um, he makes a couple other statements, but again, let's not rag on it too much. His story is basically true. Um, a few of some of it is it's because it's his own experience. 
Uh, some of it is also because he's remembering something from 41 years ago, and we all make mistakes. I made a mistake at the beginning of the broadcast. Wasn't thinking, just, you know, didn't have enough coffee today. But, um, to say, you know, he makes it sound like, and of course the argument then he goes, aha, so it wasn't until 1979 that Chinese people woke up, realized they couldn't fight, and then they, they stole, you know, Western boxing. Because he says they incorporated Western boxing. Well, people have been incorporating Western boxing forever. Each one, you know, a big deal is that they incorporate Western boxing to help them train. Incorporating some boxing, like I have, you know, I've incorporated Thai boxing and Greco-Roman and boxing and, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Sambo into what I do. It doesn't negate the Chinese martial arts that I still do. Only if I had given up all the Chinese stuff. Then it negates. But if you're incorporating it, it just means you're trying to find the better mousetrap. If you're really a fighter... Yeah, you know, I, I used to use this um, analogy. In a war, if you're an American soldier and your M16 runs out of bullets and there's an AK-47 with a full clip down in front of you on the ground, you would pick it up and start shooting. Because what you want to do is kill the enemy. You're not going to stay loyal to your M16 that has no bullets in it just because that's the American weapon and the AK-47 is the, the Russian-made weapon. People that are interested in fighting don't have these kind of perceptions um so you know he's talking in 79 they you know they took kicking and he said they took kicking from taekwondo and they took kicking from thai boxing in addition to chinese method and that's true again for the same reasons and he said you know there's a lot of shui jiao, which is not a shock shui jiao is basically in all chinese martial arts um you know and he, he talked about the fact that you know the decision was made not to have a lot of chin which is true too Though, I think a lot of people will tell you that, you know, uh, Tim Cartmel says, you know, I know 600 Shinna techniques, six of them I would rely upon. The same thing with Shui Jiao, too. You know, this is 600 different variations and throws, but probably 10 or 12 get used all the time. Um, same thing in Western wrestling, though. I mean, you know, when I, I had a coach uh, running a Greco, you know, Greco-Roman coach helping us work on our wrestling for our MMA team. Um, he went and looked through the NCAA, you know, uh, stats to figure out what scored. And of the hundreds and hundreds of different tactics and things, the highest scoring stuff was what you thought it would be. You know, single legs, double legs, you know, uh, two-on-ones, you know, um, real simple stuff. And if you look at what Dan Gable, Dan Gable preaches, the most winning coach in wrestling, it's basics. Um, this should not come as a surprise to you. If it does, that's part of the problem. If you completely deny it, well then, like I said, you know, um, we, we can't fix people that don't want to live in the real world. So, it is not black and white. It is not um, easy. It is not simple. Chinese martial arts has always had a lot of problems. Um, it's not been black and white. Uh, I should mention, though, before I tune out, people say, well, why was it 79? Well, again, remember, the communists originally were very interested in controlling all of China, especially under Mao. It was a top-down totalitarian system where literally they were interested, you know, think about the, the one-child policy. They had old women going around and looking at women's underwear to make sure they were having periods, to make sure they weren't pregnant. They were literally like in your everyday life under Mao controlled every aspect of your life day to day. When Deng Xiaoping rises to power, he's not as interested in this. He realizes that the real key is to get the economy moving. He creates the market socialist economy, which is basically like capitalism without the uh, democracy that goes with capitalism. Because he realizes that if the economy starts booming and people start making money, um, it's going to keep China moving. And it's also going to kind of like be the opiate of the masses. In other words, it's, if people are making money and they're able to go out drinking and buy cars and TVs, they're not going to be as worried about their ability to vote and, and have say in government. And it's essentially true, as, as unfortunate as that is. So in 79, when they were um, no longer interested in controlling your everyday life, they were also not interested as much in regulating martial arts. And so people were able to go, let's start creating some competitions and let's start creating some sports. And also... Um, part of it might have been um, the desire to have soft power, which is to start exporting Chinese martial arts 
as a soft power thing. And this leads to the other problem also. I mean, the Xu Xiaodong thing right now is because the soft power of exporting the fantasy of Kung Fu, um, not the reality of Kung Fu. Um, don't forget that, you know, Shaolin Temple was burned down to the ground. The Shaolin that's there now is basically a tourist trap for money. It's, it's Walt Disneyland for the ignorant. And uh, they do a great job because you can see these ignorant people that just buy it up, you know, lock, stock, barrel, and just it generates a tremendous amount of foreign capital. So, you know, and, and again, the idea that, you know, if you study Tai Chi and learn Chi, you can be, you know, Superman in six to eight weeks. This soft power stuff has promoted a lot of people that, for no other word, are frauds. So, you know, again, there's a double-edged sword. The Jian, you know, the Gim of life is that Deng Xiaoping, you know, uh, re released, relaxed the restrictions. Um, in one sense, you got Sancho Sanda. In another sense, though, you had that sort of soft power stuff that then was later exploited to create all these fake masters. And that's what Xu Xiaodong is, is trying to do, you know, expose the fake masters. And people say, well, you know, if you fought a real guy, well, the real guy wouldn't have an argument with Xu Xiaodong, and Xu Xiaodong wouldn't have an argument with the real guy either. Because, you know, like, people say, well, why didn't a lot of guys challenge the Gracies? Because the Gracies said, real fights are not pretty, they're ugly, there's a lot of grappling, um... A lot of stuff doesn't work and most people in, Ch in chinese martial arts that were grounded in reality said yeah i agree with all that <laughs> why would you not i mean we were fighting in the in the 80s right we were doing bare knuckle stuff and you get your nose you know, smashed in and you know the, you have to pick the blood out of your nose and you knew it wasn't going to look like a kung fu form it wasn't going to look like a shaw brothers movie um people got punched in the face it, it looked like kickboxing if that's what you want to call it because it's kicks and punches um nobody had like you know the chi blast from you know 30 feet nobody was blowing up chickens um it just doesn't look that way a fight looks like a fight and it looks the same no matter what style you claim you're doing, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what your affiliation is. So, Chinese martial arts is complicated because of all this cultural stuff, because of all this historical stuff. Um, in my book, I talk about, you know, also the, the desire to kind of clean it up after the boxer uprising um, and the desire to create a, a physical culture, a physical education version of Chinese martial arts. And the project was never completely finished. And, you know... Uh, New culture thought as opposed to the May 4th thought, you know, nationalists that were a little, a little more willing to embrace ridiculous chi stuff because that made Chinese martial arts unique. Whereas, you know, uh, uh, new culture people wanted to get rid of all the superstition and all the nonsense. It's not, it's not black and white. It's, it's a, a lot of shades of gray. So, um, as always, thank you guys for tuning in. This is David Ross and this is the Lions Roar Podcast. Um. I'll be back on uh, later this week for another podcast. And as always, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask.